Hey, good morning, community. It's good to see you guys. You've braved a virus and now a apparently a huge cloud of dust to get here to worship with us this morning. Uh, and it's, it's good to be together worshiping the Lord, isn't it? Um, we're going to start out now by taking a moment to silently prepare our hearts to worship the Lord together. So uh, you do that, and then I will lead us in prayer. Father, we come to you as uh, people welcomed into your presence, welcomed as your children because of the work of Christ, but as people who are um, still struggling with, fighting through um, existence in a fallen, sinful world, people who still uh, sin and struggle ourselves, um, who, who feel uh, weary and distracted by our brokenness and the brokenness of the world around us. Um, I pray this morning that you would give us a clear vision of and focus on your glory and your grace. I pray that, uh, that you would, through your word, give us uh, hope and peace and rest and joy in who you are and in what you've done for us. Do this for your glory as we lift the name of Jesus high this morning. We pray in his name. Amen. Psalm 117 calls us to worship this way. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's stand and worship. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth, shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how all thy longings have been granted in what he ordained? Praise to the Lord who with marvelous wisdom hath made thee, decked thee with health and with loving hand guided and stayed thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he defend thee. Praise to the Lord, O oh, let all that is in me adore Him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly forever adore Him. I will not be anxious. I will not be anxious. Jesus, you are near. The peace of God. 
God surrounding me and casting out all fear. The hand that holds the heavens is the mighty hand that saves. The voice that calms the storming seas is calling me by name. And I'm singing. of your grace I remember Calvary where you took my place I'm singing in the victory the victory of the cross resting in the shadow Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, this morning, Father, for the victory we have in Christ and for the 
relationship that we as believers can have with the creator of the universe. And God, this morning we come to worship you and to lift your name high and to fellowship with one another uh, and most importantly to hear your word preached. And I pray this morning that our hearts would be prepared, that we would uh, put away the, the challenges of the week and, and the, the life that we all live that's a struggle at times and that you would help us to prepare to hear your word preached in a way that would change our hearts. And God, we thank you for the gift of salvation. We come to you this morning because of what Christ has done for us. And Father, you are great and worthy to be praised, and you are the sovereign master over the entire universe. And you created everything, and Father, you created us, and we thank you for the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And God, for those who believe, we are so thankful we can say that our, our sins are forgiven, been washed in the blood of Christ and washed away our sins, and we thank you for that. And God, we also realize that we continue to sin, and we need your forgiveness, and that, Father, we are challenged on a daily basis to confess our sin to you and to ask you to forgive us, and you will, and cleanse us from the unrighteousness that our sin brings into our lives. And I pray that you would help us this morning to have a clean slate as we listen to your word preached and lift up your name. Father, we know also that the sin that we have can keep us away from you. And um, God, it's important. And I pray that each person here this morning would see their sin in the way you do. And God, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to lift your name up. We pray for CBC, that you would do a great work in our body, that you would meet the needs, that you would provide leadership and discernment and wisdom as all of us work through important areas of our lives and situations. And God, we pray that you would help us to grow together as a body and be in great unity. Father, we also thank you. There are many all over the world who are lifting your name high this morning. Father, we specifically lift up First Baptist Church of Lake Butler and Jason Johns, the pastor there, and pray for the congregation that you would, uh, as we would desire you to do in our hearts this morning, do a great work in the hearts of that congregation, Father, as they worship you this morning. And pray, God, that you would just speak through their hearts in a great way. Father, we also gather here, just like so many others all over the world, and we just pray, God, that you would just give that same spirit to all those who are lifting your name high this morning and we pray God that you would use the word of God this morning to change our hearts we pray for John Sweat that you would use him this morning that he'd die to self and that the spirit of God would use him in a way that would bring glory and honor to you we thank you so much and we pray these things in Jesus name amen Amen. well as we continue in worship in just a second we're going to read from John chapter 10 um, but before we do that, I just want to remind you again that uh, even though we're not taking an offering physically in our services, we're not passing a plate, um, there is still an option for you to give online if you want to do that. Um, and many of you have been doing that faithfully, and we appreciate that greatly. But I just want to make sure that we, we remind you of that, keep that in front of you in case uh, you're you know, waiting for the day that we can pass the plate again. Hopefully that comes sooner than later. But, uh, but you can give uh, in the meantime. And we are really thankful for the, uh, the faithful giving of our church members and the provision of God um, during this season of quarantine and virus and things like that. Um, but let's stand as we read from John chapter 10. This is the word of the Lord. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. 
All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus, in describing himself as the door uh, of the sheep, is saying there's no other entry point into eternal life but through him. We can't access eternal life on our own. No one else can access eternal life for us. It only happens through Jesus Christ, through his life and his death and his resurrection. But more than that, he's more than just the entry point. Jesus is the eternal life itself. He is the experience of eternal life. He is the experience of abundant life. We read that throughout Scripture. We read that other places in the, in the Gospel of John. Let's say in the, in the presence of God is fullness of joy. He's our portion. He's the bread of life. We don't experience abundant life necessarily uh, in terms of earthly abundance. We have something far greater than that. We have Jesus Christ. We know God. And there is joy and rest and hope and satisfaction beyond anything that we can imagine in Christ. There is ultimate joy and rest and hope. So we lift our voices, joining the refrain of, the Christian, of Christians throughout time, the refrain of the Christian life, and saying, Jesus alone. Amen. Let's testify together. guilty soul condemned by shame hear mercy calling out your name his blood can cleanse your every stain bring your failure to the cross oh hungry soul lay down your pride Come feast upon the bread of life For all who taste are satisfied Bring your longing to the cross Come you weary, find your comfort Come you lost and find your home there is grace for every sinner, perfect rest in Christ alone. Oh, troubled soul, be lifted up. Take courage now in Jesus' love. Cast all your fears and sorrows down. Bring your burdens to the cross. Come, you weary, find your comfort. And find your home. There is grace for every sinner, perfect rest in Christ alone. truth and life, our glory and reward. He's the faithful one, steady cornerstone, our hope forevermore. He is good and kind, perfect truth and life, our glory and reward. He's faithful, he's the faithful 
faithful one, steady cornerstone, our hope forevermore. Come you weary, find your comfort. Come you lost and find your home. There is grace for every sinner. Perfect rest in Christ alone.
we believe that that is true, that we have nothing and are nothing apart from Christ. So I pray that you would, through your word this morning, build and ground our hope and our confidence and our joy in who Jesus is and in what he has done uh, to make us your own. We pray in his name. Amen. All right, well, good morning. If you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles to Proverbs, we'll be looking at the fear of the Lord this morning in the book of Proverbs, so we'll be uh, sort of all over the place, but we'll begin in Proverbs chapter 1. There is a place in South Carolina called Paris Island. It is a place where Marines are made. It is a place that is accompanied with lots of myths and lore and terrifying stories. It's an island filled by, or, or surrounded by a swamp full of uh, alligators and more mosquitoes than you could ever hope for. And in the sand, there's these things called sand fleas that will uh, remove your skin quite effectively. And there's also these creatures on Paris Island called drill instructors. And they are, at least uh, from what you see, they seem to be non-human. They don't sleep. They don't get tired. The only thing that gets tired about them is their voices. And it makes it sound even scarier when they're yelling at you. And I remember on August 9, 2009, making my way to Paris Island with some other recruits on a bus... And as we got to the bridge that takes you over onto the island, the uh, bus driver says, now you need to put your heads between your knees and close your eyes. You're not allowed to see how you get on the island, so you can't get off, till we say. And I remember as we, the van stopped, uh, we got out, and I stood on these yellow footprints, these iconic footprints before this brass double door with a huge eagle globe and anchor on it. And there was my encounter with this first creature, this drill instructor. And all the YouTube videos I had watched, there was iconic music playing in the background. It was glorious. It was exciting. There was no music. And I wasn't watching a video in my own home. I was there. And I had instant regret. Yet what I found out in my time... Paris Island is that the lore and myths of Paris Island are terrifying, but after being there for some time, I realized that it was just a hot place with crazy, funny drill instructors who were mere men like me. However, the Bible calls us to fear the Lord, and unlike my drill instructors, he is not a man. In fact, Hebrews says it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. And the Bible gives us limitless words to describe our relationship with God. An abundance of words to describe our relationship with God. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we often never use the word fear. And I wonder why that is. As we look at Proverbs this morning, I just want to briefly look at Exodus 20.20. And you don't need to turn there. I'll read it for us. But I think Exodus 20.20 sort of helps us wrap our arms around this idea of fearing the Lord. And I think in this text, and in other texts, but we're just going to look at this one this morning, it helps us to see that there's two ways a person can fear the Lord. The context of Exodus 20.20 is Israel has just been redeemed out of slavery in Egypt, and God has brought them into the wilderness to make them a holy people. And so now they are at the base of Mount Sinai, and God is speaking from the mountain, and he is giving them his law. But accompanied with the Lord's speech is this terrifying and supernatural scene. It it almost, as you're reading the text in Exodus 19-20, sounds as if the mountain is falling apart, or it's about to erupt or explode. And the people are so afraid at the sight of what is going on and and hearing the voice of the Lord that they beg Moses, tell God to stop speaking to us lest we die. 
And Moses responds in Exodus 20, 20 with this. And this is in the New American Standard. I think it captures, captures what is conveyed in this verse well. Moses says, do not be afraid. For God has come in order to test you. And in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Now that's interesting. He tells them, don't be afraid. And yet the Lord is revealed in this way so that you might fear him. I think this text and other texts, there's, there's this distinction or these two types or two ways that we can fear the Lord. There's first the fear of a servant. The fear of a servant is a posture of terror and dread towards a malevolent, uh, um, mal- malevolent owner. This is the implanted knowledge of God's wrath that the sinner cannot escape. The day of vengeance is coming. Calvin, John Calvin, uh, writing about this sort of knowledge or this sort of fear of God, he writes, It is the boldest despiser of God is of all men the most startled at the rustling of a falling leaf. Where does this fear come, come from? It comes from the vengeance of the divine majesty which strikes the sinner's conscience all the more violently, the more and more they try to flee from it. There is no rest for the sinner why God's wrath abides upon them. But there's also a fear of a son or a fear of a daughter. This is the sort of fear that is a posture of respect and reverence for a kind and awesome father. Recognizing who God is and who we are in relationship to him in Christ. Certainly, this fear does possess a sort of holy trembling before the Lord because he is a consuming fire. But notice, it's a fear from faith. Why the former is a fear from unbelief. Fear of the Lord as a benevolent father is a fear that is found only in Christ by faith. And Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. And he delivered me. From all my fears. And so the scriptures are really chocked full of commands to fear God and examples of men and women fearing God, both from a posture of a servant that is quaking before the vengeance of the Lord and from a posture of a son and daughter before a kind and um, gracious Heavenly Father. And what I want to ask this morning, the question I want us to ask is how does the book of Proverbs uh, really? uniquely teach us what it means to fear the Lord? How does the book of Proverbs teach us what it means to fear the Lord? First, the book of Proverbs teaches us that the fear of the Lord is knowing God. The fear of the Lord is knowing God. And in Proverbs chapter 1, Solomon begins by giving a couple of purposes for why he's writing these Proverbs to his son. Chapter 1, verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction. Verse 3, To receive instruction and wise dealing. Verse 4, to give prudence to the simple. Verse 6, to understand a proverb and a saying. And these four verses really culminate in and are grounded in what he says in verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Or to put it as a a, a quote that Matt gave at the beginning of this sermon series, one writer says, Proverbs claims that the acquisition or the apprehending of true wisdom comes from a right relationship with God, which is manifested in the fear of the Lord. And so true wisdom begins with God because he's the creator and definer of reality. The fool looks at the world and breathes God's air and sees bare facts. The wise man looks at the world and sees God's facts. For it is God in whose image he is made. It is God who has created space and time and the laws of nature and the laws of science, the human mind and the laws of thought which cause it to function properly. God's revelation, God's self-revelation is imprinted upon all of creation. You cannot escape it. Cornelius Van Til, a Dutch theologian, 
says this, the very factness, the very fact, factness of any individual fact of history is precisely what it is because God is what he is. God makes the facts to be what they are. And so someone else, another Dutch guy says, the world is an embodiment of the thoughts of God. It is a beautiful book in which all creatures, great and small, are as letters to make us ponder the invisible things of God. So that then means that fearing the Lord is the foundation of all wisdom, and fearing the Lord is to know God. Proverbs 2.5 says, Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. But that then means the opposite is also true. Not fearing the Lord is to hate knowledge. Proverbs 1.29, Because they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord. And so that means the unbeliever cannot ultimately know anything. Certainly the unbeliever can know true things about the world, like two plus two is four, and if you jump off of a building, gravity is going to hurt you. But they have no ultimate ground for why those things are true. They have no ultimate ground outside of time and space for why today will be like tomorrow. They live and they breathe in the atmosphere of God's creation and self-revelation, and yet in the name of reason and science and progress, they suppress the innate revelation of God and they embrace foolishness. Or as one of my girls say, they embrace stupidness. And some unbelievers are more consistent in their rejection of God and consequently their rejection of wisdom. I was looking at Pinterest that's the shameful thing to say. And uh, there's a piece of art I found, and on it, it said, everything we see is a perspective, not the truth. In other words, there is no objectivity or transcendence in creation because life is just one big obstacle illusion. And if there is no God, you might as well live like that, like you're in the matrix, You'll see it one way if you take the blue pill, and you'll see it another way if you take the red pill. I, I can't remember if it was first or third grade, but somewhere in those early years of elementary, I played youth softball for my church. It was a church league. It was for all the little boys who were too bad to play real baseball. And I had a friend. His name was Ty, Ty Harden. And Ty was in the outfield, and Ty could never catch a pop fly ball to save his life. We just thought he was hopeless. In fact, we'd put him in right field so that way no one would hit to him. And finally, um, I don't remember if it was the coach who was my dad or his mom, but finally someone said, hey, I think he needs to go to the eye doctor. And the interesting, the interesting thing is, after Ty got his glasses, he was an amazing softball player. He couldn't see the ball. He could see this blurry object, and he's running. You could feel bad for him. He's that, you just lost him saying, this guy just needs to sit on the bench. In a similar way, the fear of the Lord is wisdom glasses by which we know God, know ourselves, and know what is true in the world. There's one more thing I'd like to say about this knowledge of the Lord. This knowledge is not bare assent to facts. It's not a, a bare recognition that God's real or that God's the boss. Demons have that sort of knowledge of God. This fear of the Lord, this knowledge of God is friendship with God. Psalm 25, 14 says this, The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him, and He makes known to them His covenant. So I think there's a word of warning for us that the professing Christian that has no concept of fearing the Lord may indeed not know the Lord. Their relationship with God is informed by their materialism and broken friendship with other sinners rather than the absolute blessedness and holiness of God whose kindness leads them to repentance. God created man in his image for intimate communion with him for his glory. That then means that salvation is not a benefit package to attain, but salvation is, is God through Christ, bringing us to himself for intimate communion with him. And so fear of the Lord is knowing God, and this knowledge is the foundation of all wisdom, and, and this knowledge is intimate friendship with God. 
In the middle of July, I'm going to preach on friendship and Proverbs, and so I'll come back to that idea of friendship with God, but we'll leave it there for now. The second thing that Proverbs teaches us is that fear of the Lord is trusting God. Go to Proverbs 3 with me, if you will. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7. The fear of the Lord is trusting God. Verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. The fear of the Lord trusts that God's eyes are better than yours. In other words, this trust is a recognition and awareness that you are not God and God is God. I want you to think for a moment with me, if you will, of a, of a, of a situation where you had to make an extremely difficult decision. And now I want you to think about how limited you, how limited you were in your own finiteness and evaluating, controlling, and making the right decision in the midst of that situation. Think about it. What you couldn't see, God saw. Where you couldn't be, God is. What you couldn't control, God controlled. What you didn't know, God knew. And while your sin, while your decisions are clouded by sin, God's aren't. Fearing the Lord is letting God be God and you, well, being you, creaturely, dusty, weak, limited, forgetful, bound by time, restricted by space, never knowing enough. God is none of those things. God is not limited in anything. Also, the one who fears the Lord doesn't follow her heart. Rather, she trusts in the Lord with all of her heart. It is a certainty in God and not in self. A great uh, allegorical novel written by John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress in the 1600s, a beautiful, a beautiful book that in, in story format and allegory displays the Christian life. And you're going to hear this here first. This book surpasses C.S. Lewis's work. This book surpasses J.R.R. Tolkien's work. I know, you, you didn't think I was going to say that. This book would have been, by the way, in the 16 and 1700s and the Christian's home right there by their Bible. And it is the second most sold book in the entirety of humanity. Second, the Bible, of course. In John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, there's a man named Christian Pilgrim. And along the way, he finds other Christian pilgrims, one named Hopeful and one named Faithful. Faithful is killed in the city of Vainglory. He's martyred. After leaving that city, he, Christian Pilgrim, meets up with another man named Hopeful Pilgrim, and they journey their way, they're making their way to the celestial city, the heavenly city. And after uh, escaping Doubting Castle, they run into a character named Ignorance. This is why Pilgrim's Progress is classic, Ignorance. And they, they let him catch up to them, and they're beginning to walk together, and Christian Pilgrim says, where are you headed? And he says, oh, I'm headed to the, to the heavenly city. And he says, well, how do you know you're, you're, they're going to let you in when you get there? And ignorance says, my heart tells me so. And Christian Pilgrim says, well, hearts are deceitful. And your heart's going to deceive you, and you think you have good thoughts and intentions. How do you know you have good thoughts and intentions? And he says, my heart tells me that I have good thoughts and intentions. And so Christian Pilgrim goes on to correct him and point him to the truth of the gospel. And ignorance, being ignorant, dismisses it and walks away. But the one who fears the Lord has certainty in God and not in self. It's a conviction that God is who his word says he is. And though you can't see behind the situation or though you can't understand why God commands the things that he does, you do see the Lord and you know that he is good and you know that he is worthy to be honored. And so with a childlike faith, even in the midst of blindness where you can't see why, you trust him. And so where Christians have we been wise in our own eyes and where have we demeaned God and his ways by our lack of trust in him? The third thing Proverbs teaches us about fearing the Lord is the fear of the Lord is honoring God. 
And I'll just read these two texts for us. They're in different chapters. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance in the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Proverbs 14, 2 says, Whoever walks in a brightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. The fear of the Lord is to honor God above all else. To love what God loves. To hate what God hates. The man who fears the Lord draws the line clear in the sand between good and evil, and he does not venture near that line, lest he fall across it. One commentator speaking of this honoring of God through the fear of the Lord says, It is the hatred of all evil in general, the hatred of evil thoughts, the hatred of evil words, the hatred of evil actions, the hatred of evil company, the hatred of evil worship, and the hatred of all evil doctrines by the fear of the Lord, which shows itself in a hatred of evil because of the loathsome nature of it and being contrary to God and His will as it appears in the law of God. And yet... Our pet sins, our political commitments, our family upbringing, our life experience causes us to give safe refuge to the enemy of evil in our homes and hearts. We will be quick and courageous to call out the popular and visible sins that we can see But when the light is shined upon those sins that we hold dearest in our hearts, we will protect and defend them at all costs. You see it the wrong way. You don't understand. That's not my motive. And yet you are harboring that enemy within your heart. And let me be also quick to remind us that evil and sin are not rebellion against some arbitrary commands of God. God is not arbitrary. God is not capricious. God is not vindictive. God does not give commands to see how much He can make you do before you lose it. All of God's commands are holy, righteous, and good because they reflect His moral character. And therefore... Evil and sin are not rebellious against arbitrary commands. Evil and sin are rebellious against the holy God who has made you in His image. And so the one who fears the Lord, trusts God's commands, are holy, righteous, and good, and seeks to honor Him by them. And this honoring of God flows from, quote, a reverential affection for Him, which is peculiar to God's children. It is a godly fear, which is consistent with strong faith, great joy, and true courage, and it is the opposite to pride and self-confidence, and it is accompanied with real holiness. And it takes its rise from the grace of God. This is a fear of sonship. This is a fear of a daughter. This is a fear that arises out of the grace of God in the saved sinner. This is a fear that is a result of spirit-produced faith in Christ that results in the sinner having a reverential affection for God and an all-consuming desire to honor Him in all things. Not as a means to earn God's grace, but rather as a result of having tasted and experienced God's grace. And so as we fight sin, Christian, your fear of loss, your fear of the consequences of sin, your fear of man are not strong enough deterrents to keep you from sinning. Those motivations will fall short every time. But a holy and affectionate fear of the Lord produced by the Spirit is what we need to put to death what is fleshly within us. We must fight sin first and foremost because we love God so much that we want nothing in our lives to dishonor Him or to hinder our fellowship with Him. I'm not talking about a loss of salvation here. I'm talking about a loss of the joy of our communion with God. And as we think about this honoring the Lord in all things, and we think about 
ourselves as Christians who are also Americans, I fear that some Christians fear socialism and communism more than they fear the Lord. They're ready to fight for their rights when they're threatened. But when it's God's rights who are challenged, they're not moved at all. It's not necessarily either or. But God forbid the Lord ever ask of you to give up your rights for the sake of the gospel. And my concern is that Christians are easily moved with great zeal to fight for their rights in the public square, but can be barely moved to serve the Lord's church or proclaim the gospel in the public square. We'll readily look the fool for defending liberty, but we'll never allow ourselves to look the fool for proclaiming the gospel. The foolishness of liberty, we'll defend. The foolishness of the cross, God forbid, I won't talk about that. And when children see their father's patriotism, but see little of their father's allegiance to King Jesus by way of service and leadership in the home and the church, who do you think you're teaching your children to honor above all else? The fear of the Lord is honoring God. The last thing, perhaps surprisingly, that Proverbs teaches us about the fear of the Lord is that the fear of the Lord is fullness of life. And I've got several texts here, and I'm only going to read a few, and I'll give you the references to the others, but listen to these texts. The fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Proverbs 15, 16, better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Proverbs 14, 26 talks about this as well. Proverbs 19, 23 says, the fear of the Lord leads to life, then the one rests content and untouched by trouble. Proverbs 22, 4, humility is the, the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. Now, if we're not careful, the collection of these five Proverbs, if we take them uh, apart from the rest of the book or we take them individual from one another, we might walk away assuming that fullness of life means an abundance of material possessions and a life of no suffering. But rather, fullness of life is enjoyment of God and his gifts and creation. And indeed, the Lord can and does often bless his people with material possessions and often does keep his people from suffering. However, those blessings pale in comparison to the satisfaction, the rest, the assurance, and the peace that is found in God by Christ through the Spirit. These blessings, these inheritances are unfading, undefiled, and unending, and they're being kept for you in heaven, and you experience them already right now. The fear of the Lord is to have fullness of life in Christ right now and a sure hope of an even fuller life in the age to come. And so what I want to point out to us this morning is that the fear of the Lord is not contrary to the fullness of life. Those that fear the Lord have the fullest lives now and in eternity. And man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. They go together. And so what would it mean? What would it mean for us as a church and us as individuals and families and the chaos of our nation right now to be able to demonstrate a peace and a rest in Christ? despite what is going on. What would that look like to the world? Because I fear, even though in good hearts to say true things and to call out bad things in our world right now, we do it from a position of fear and unrest and no peace. But what would it mean like in our nation and in the struggle against sin and in the brokenness of your relationships to actually believe that in Christ we have rest, peace, and fullness of life. What would it mean to believe that you're safe in the depths of the fortress of God, which no man or demon can besiege? Fear the Lord. Rest in Christ. 
glory and the abundance of life that he has given you already in the midst of this world. And may I remind us that our freedom in Christ is not contingent upon the safety of our freedoms as citizens. In fact, I would wager that Christians who don't have freedoms and the places in which they live have a, a, a better sense of what it means to be free in Christ than we do. So the glorification of God and our enjoyment of God and His creation go together. God's glory and our good go together. And so Proverbs shows us that the fear of the Lord is knowing, trusting, and honoring God. And simultaneously, the fear of the Lord is fullness of life. And maybe to put it more succinctly, and maybe this will help you remember it this week, the fear of the Lord is friendship with God and fullness of life. The fear of the Lord is friendship with God and fullness of life. And yet, if we're honest, we don't fear the Lord as we should. Our knowledge of God lacks depth and intimacy. The lack of depth and intimacy of your knowledge of God, if that was truly present for a long manifested period of time in your marriage, your marriage would be done. For some of us, our knowledge of God and our friendship with God is is confined to this hour. This is it. He's basically that Facebook acquaintance. You met someone in the grocery store and you thought it was socially acceptable to send them a friend request. You talked to them one time about oranges. And when I say friendship, that's what you think you've got with God, that. He gives me stuff. Our knowledge of God lacks depth and intimacy because we do not know God's word. He's revealed himself not only in creation and our conscience, but in the word of God. Our trust in God is feeble. And our lack of honoring God is treasonous. Our honor for the Lord is treasonous. And all the while we pursue a fullness of life, our version of the fullness of life, that is empty, temporary, and it ultimately dishonors the Lord. So this leaves us asking the question that Psalm 133 asks. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? If you, Lord, should mark my iniquities, how could I stand before you? Who could stand before the great and awesome God who consumed Elijah's sacrifice on Mount Carmel? Who can stand before the thrice holy God of Isaiah 6 who will judge the secrets of men and women's hearts at the day of judgment? Who will escape the vengeance of the Lord? Who has uh, clean hands and a pure heart? Who can ascend God's mountain and stand before his presence? No one. The law of God exposes our utter sinfulness in contrast to God's utter holiness. And yet, Psalm 130 goes on in verse 4. After asking the question, if you should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? Verse 4 says, verse 4 says this, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. The beauty of the gospel is that God sent His Son to fulfill the law's demand for us. The righteous requirements of God were met for us in Christ, the law-keeping, God-fearing Son of God. In fact, that's how the Messiah is described by Isaiah in Isaiah 11.3. And He will delight in the fear of the Lord, and He will not judge by what His eyes see, nor make a decision by what His eyes hear. And so Jesus Christ feared God for us. In him, we see intimate friendship, trust, and honor towards the Father. And he, being the first fruits of the resurrection, has secured fullness of life for us 
in eternal communion with God. For the unbeliever here this morning, I prayed for you this morning. I'm glad you're here. And I hope that you feel the crushing weight of your sin. I hope it takes your breath away. I hope it makes your body ache because you feel the the depth of, of how much sin has affected you and how much you have sinned against this holy God. And I hope you've been moved moved to great fear of the wrath of God that still abides upon you. It's not because I get any sort of pleasure of scaring you, but because I know of a great Savior in whom the wrath of God has been satisfied. So repent of your sin and look to Christ and take hold of Him. Where there is rest in Christ and friendship with God. Christian, we're to fear the Lord, knowing, trusting, and honoring Him in all of life. Not a fear towards a malevolent owner or a capricious God, but a fear towards a reverential Father who has been kind and gracious to us and steadfast to us in all of our days in spite of our sinfulness. Let's pray. Lord, this is a this is certainly a difficult sermon to preach. Feeling my my own treason in my heart for failing to honor you and give reverence to you. Not because you are some dictator in heaven who rules me with a rod of iron, but because you have, you have loved me with such kindness and faithfulness and your mercies are new every morning and yet I fail to, to fear you. I fail to honor you and trust you. I feel the lack of intimacy with you. I feel the, I think of the passing of my days without a thought of you and maybe a, a, a quick thought before I go to sleep at night. Lord, I pray that we would fear you. That we would see you in all of your glory and your holiness in Jesus Christ. And that we would honor you. Lord, be with us and be with our church and continue to use your word to shape us and your spirit to conform us into the image of your son. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. And let's stand and sing in response. Oh Lord, my rock. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Greatest treasure of my longing soul. My God. Like you, there is no other. True delight is found in you alone. Your grace, a well too deep to fathom. Your love exceeds the heavens' reach. Your truth a fount of perfect wisdom, my highest good and my unending need. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer,
despite the cruel deceiver and my shield against his hateful darts. My song when enemies surround me. My hope when tides of sorrow Trials are abounding, your faithfulness, my refuge in the night. Oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Gracious Savior of my ruined life, my guilt and cross laid on your shoulders. In my place, you suffered, bled, and died. You rose, the grave and death are conquered. Christ be with your spirit and grace be with you all. Amen.